Amazon's rings of power is nothing more than a very public temper tantrum. It's what happens when you allow hate, driven by spite and resentment, to consume your soul. You lash out at anybody or anything that dares have the audacity to defy what you have dictated. Why do the writers of the Rings of Power hate J.R.R. Tolkien and his legacy, despite the fact that they're working on the show allegedly inspired by Tolkien's work? Moral inspiration. Those without a morality are incapable of understanding moral inspiration. But wait a minute, Randy. You keep saying the writers of the Rings of Power are driven by ideology. Ideology is not the same as morality. When you sacrifice everything on the altar of ideology, you have to abandon morality. Otherwise, the ends don't justify the means. Moral inspiration acts as a mirror. It holds up an ideal, and then we are asked to compare ourselves, our actions, attitudes, behaviors, to that ideal. Those without morality hate the mirror. They don't like what they see. But instead of engaging in self-reflection, they seek to destroy the mirror and anybody who places value in that mirror. Over the last few years, we have seen the results of imposing ideology on movies, TV shows, video games, whatnot. It has completely destroyed storytelling. But like a pebble thrown into a puddle of water, the ripples of damage continue to spread out, going into all sorts of areas, like architecture. Architecture serves two purposes. The first one is functional. It has to be able to do the job it was created to do. If you are hired to design an office building, it better be able to be used as an office building. The second purpose is what separates architecture from building. Architecture communicates ideas. A work of architecture communicates the values of the client, the architect, and the culture that they come from. One of the ideas that architecture has been very good at communicating? Inspiration. Early 20th century American skyscrapers inspired a culture to dream big, to believe there wasn't anything they couldn't accomplish. Gothic cathedrals like Chartres inspired people to look up, to think of things greater than themselves. The Trevi Fountain inspires awe and wonder, and it communicates the Italian Renaissance belief that art benefits society. J.R.R. Tolkien has an impressive body of work in architecture. The fact that it is fictional does not in any way diminish its ability to communicate and to inspire. Tolkien used his architecture to identify and communicate the uniqueness of each group in Middle-earth. Tolkien understood the power, evocative, inspirational nature of ruins. Humans naturally gravitate towards ruins. We are fascinated by what came before us and inspired by what could be again. The Lord of the Rings takes place with men, elves, dwarves, living amongst the ruins of a lost golden age. But if you know where to look, sometimes in plain sight, sometimes hidden away, are living remnants of that golden age. The first elven architecture we encounter is Rivendell, a little village perched on the edge of a cliff. This is a people lost in time, lost in memory. Stone foundations, wooden structures, thin columns, delicate details, light and ephemeral. There is a blurring of the line between interior and exterior spaces. Interior decorations are inspired by natural forms, further blurring the line between the natural world and the built world. Lothlorien reinforces the idea of a culture lost in time, slowly drowning in its memories, no longer concerned with the outside world. Rivendell may have blurred the lines between natural world and built world. Lothlorien just gets rid of it. There is no longer a distinction between the two. You still see the timeless, restrained elegance light, ephemeral columns and structures. Elven architecture tells us of a proud, sophisticated, cultured people who are now tired and are fading away. But we get a glimpse of what they were capable of in their prime. Dwarves, on the other hand, in the mines of Moria, we see a culture in its prime cut low by tragedy. The dwarves are a people who think big, big projects, big scale. 
The dwarves carved an entire city out of the living rock. The dwarves were engineers, and their love of mathematics and geometry affected everything from their grandest civil engineering projects all the way down to their decorations. Doors, walls, whatever, didn't matter. They were all covered with intricate, finely carved geometric shapes. The dwarves were a paranoid race. I guess that comes with hoarding all those gems and precious metals. The dwarves prioritized defense. If you were going to try to break into one of their cities, you were going to pay a massive price. Dwarven architecture tells us of a proud, stubborn people with the massive egos and arrogance off the charts, but they have the skills to back it up. Gondor is the remnants of the remnants of a golden age. Their architecture combines the dwarves' building expertise with the elves' elegant sophistication. Gondorian architecture is sturdy and reliable, built to last, but there's also a desire for the grand, impressive, awe-inspiring. The city's starting to show its age. It's worn, some parts dilapidated, and here and there, an empty house. Gondorian architecture tells of a people who are willing to step up, guard the gate, fight so others don't have to, but they want the glory. They demand credit for what they are doing. But like the elves, they are also a culture in decline, more interested in remembering past glories than achieving new glory. Now, y'all are more than welcome to disagree with my interpretations of Tolkienian architecture. That's the very nature of architectural criticism. There is one thing that is indisputable. All three groups, men, elves, dwarves, had a unique architecture that told us something important about the values of each group. Rings of Power, Season 2, Episodes 2 and 3, is what happens when you refuse to do anything that could be even remotely associated with inspiration. If Rivendell and La Florian are faded memories of elven architecture, then the Rings of Power, which takes place thousands of years before, during the prime of elven civilization, then the architecture should be even more impressive, or you would think at least on par. What in the living hell is this? Where is the elegant, restrained sophistication? What does this tell us about elves? Why should we even assume this has anything to do with elves besides a couple elves standing in it? This doesn't look like elven architecture. It looks like somebody's dilapidated rustic hunting lodge. In Rivendell, they integrated the built environment into nature. Here, we just have some tree growing up over the top of the building. Makes the place look run down, like it's not being maintained. Having dead leaves scattered everywhere doesn't help with that impression either. Why are they using the same yellow golden light as found in Rivendell? In Rivendell, these colors represented autumn, memory, fading, death. It symbolized a culture at its end. Why are they using this particular symbolism on elven culture at its peak that's going to last for thousands more years? I'll tell you exactly why. They don't know what they're doing. They're trying to copy Rivendell without understanding what made Rivendell work. They've tried to copy the architectural language of Rivendell, columns, sculptural elements, but the proportions and details are all wrong. It's clunky and inelegant. There is no way in hell that Rivendell is descended from this architectural tradition. As a matter of fact, this is derivative of Rivendell architecture. And then there's a Region. I'm going to ask the same question. I'm going to keep asking the same question over and over again. You should pick up on the theme. What does this city tell us about the elves? Why should we even assume that this city is full of elves besides that they tell us it's full of elves? The design language has been changed. It's been established that yes, elves will build with stone, but they prefer to use wood. And now we have a city with large portions of it made out of nothing but stone. Why? We've also established that the elves like to have their built environment integrated with the natural environment. Here, there's none of that. Oh, there's some vines growing everywhere, but that just makes the place look run down and dilapidated. Parts of the city are wooden, and there are shapes and decorative elements that copy Rivendell. 
When it comes to the building style and the way they're constructed, as you will see later, they're no different than human buildings. Eregion is right next to a mountain, where part of the city is carved into that mountain. Numenor is also carved into the side of a mountain. Khazadum is also carved into the side of a mountain. Well, they are inside a cave, so I guess that makes it completely different. I'm still trying to figure out what happened to Khazadum. The Rings of Power is supposedly telling us all about the fall of Khazadum. Well, we know what Khazadum looked like before the fall. We've seen it. There are massive halls with rows and rows of columns carved out of the living stone. There are intricate carvings everywhere. And we even know the shapes of the doors. I don't know where this is, but this ain't Khazadum. First off, you don't have open fires in a cave. Carbon monoxide poisoning anyone? Khazadum was built on a massive scale. And we're supposed to believe that this is the king's throne room? <laughs> Do we get to see any of these grand halls, town centers, armories even? Nah, we get to see the market. The teeny tiny dank dark little market. Why does the dwarf market have cloth awnings? Underground? This is supposed to be the precise, intricate, detailed carving of a race of engineers? This has nothing in common with the cause of doom that we saw in Peter Jackson's adaptations. I go back to my original question. What does this architecture tell us about dwarves as a people? Outside of it being underground, why would we even assume that dwarves live here? As crude, rough, makeshift, patched together as it is, it could very well be an orc town. Refugees are living amongst what we've been told are the ruins of an old Numenorean settlement. <laughs> I again ask the question. How would we know these ruins are Numenorean if somebody wasn't flapping their gums at the camera? In Jackson's adaptation, all three races had a very clear design language. The elves emphasized the Gothic arch, the pointed arch. Gondor used the Romanesque arch, the curved arch, and the dwarves had a trapezoidal arch. In the Rings of Power, however, Gothic, Romanesque, it doesn't matter. They're used indiscriminately by everybody, oftentimes in the same flippin' building. As is my want this video, I come back to that question. Outside of somebody opening their cake hole, why would we know that this is Numenorean architecture? Y'all see that stone tower, center right? Kinda looks like a Region architecture. Y'all see those wooden buildings that the humans have put up among the Numenorean ruins? You add on some superficial decorations, and they look an awful lot like elven architecture. You take those same wooden buildings, throw a little mud on them, put them in Mordor, they look an awful lot like orc buildings. The writers of the Rings of Power do not understand architecture whatsoever. They fail to understand that architecture communicates. And one of the things that it communicates every single time is the values of the architect. Every time we design, we put on Front Street what we value most. The writers are doing a lot more confessing than they realize. But it's worse than that. These writers have no clue. They don't even understand basic concepts like geometry and physics. Case in point, the well. Yeah, I'm obsessed with arches today. This well is completely unbelievable. As depicted, it can't exist. It defies physics. First off, we're supposed to believe that this well was made with dry masonry, no mortar. Dry masonry is very strong in compression, pushing down force but it has no strength when it comes to tension, pulling force. An arch naturally wants to flatten. They've put a heavy weight, a bell, on that arch, which increases its desire to become flat. The top of the arch goes into compression. That's good. That actually makes the arch stronger. But the bottom of the arch is in tension. Do you all see a problem with this particular well? The stones that make up the arch, most of them don't go all the way through. They used multiple stones in each section. 
The stones in the bottom part of the arch, they're in the part of the arch under tension. There's nothing holding them in place. They're defying gravity. The whole arch is defying gravity. Let's assume they use the proper stones in the arch. It still wouldn't work. You have all the weight of the arch and the weight of the bell trying to flatten out the arch. When you put an arch on top of a column, it wants to push the top of the column sideways. This puts the outside of the column into compression and the inside of the column into tension. Both your columns will want to collapse inwards, dropping all of that rubble into your well. There's an obvious solution. Thick columns. These people are so stupid. We're going to end with my favorite example of the writers or whoever came up with this mess. Their complete and utter incompetence. The throne room, temple, whatever thing, they've never made it clear in Numenor. It's clearly a ripoff of Hagia Sophia. I don't have a problem with that in of itself. If you're going to rip off something, at least rip off something good. And Hagia Sophia is most definitely good. This is supposed to be monumental architecture. Pay very close attention to the size of the building as opposed to every other building around it. We have a close-up of the eagle at the entrance. Now again, look at the size of the entrance. Look at the size of the eagle and look at the size of all the other buildings around that main dome. Now we look at the interior, the space under that dome with the camera looking towards the entrance where the eagle is doing its thing. What's the problem, right? Well, let's take a little gander at the inside of Hagia Sophia, shall we? Hagia Sophia is huge. All the little dots on the bottoms of both these pictures those are people. The interior and exterior spaces don't add up. Okay, that just means the Numenorean building is smaller than Hagia Sophia. That just adds to the problem. Y'all see those two monumental statues on the front of the building? Supposed to remind you of something. Not sure what, though. They suddenly stop looking so grand. Y'all see that long promenade thing that sticks out of the front of the building? Supposed to remind you of something? Again, can't quite place what. It suddenly stops looking so grand. Y'all see all the little buildings that surround the Hagia Sophia ripoff? There is now a question if they're big enough for human use. Like the well, this is a foundational, fundamental mistake that a first-year architecture student would not make. Leastways, not in my class. A work of architecture reveals the values of the architect, the designer. If you feel nothing but contempt for the people who will use your architecture, that attitude will always reveal itself in your work, in neon colors. If you reject the very notion of inspiration, you're going to have a small, petty, narrow view of the world, and you're going to only be able to create a small, narrow, petty architecture. If you have no faith in humanity, you will create an architecture that has no faith in humanity. The writers of the Rings of Power have approached architecture the same way they've approached storytelling. As long as you have the right ideology, the right agenda, screw everything else, including physics and geometry. The writers hate, driven by spite and resentment, their contempt for the source material, their contempt for its architecture, their contempt for the audience is on display for all the world to see. Architecture communicates. That's its reason for being. <laughs> if you're going to mess around with architecture, you better know what you're doing. Otherwise, you just might tell on yourself. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, you all be safe. If you all are still here, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.